When Rudolph Valentino moved to United Artists as an independent, he was in sore need of a box office hit. His last two films under his Paramount contract were not the hits that The Sheik and Blood and Sand were. Formerly cinematic gold, his screen popularity at this point was more like tarnished brass. First announced was The Bronze Collar, which was quickly vetoed. The Black Eagle started production in the early spring of 1925. The film was almost immediately retitled to simply The Eagle, given that Douglas Fairbanks was currently working on The Black Pirate. An awful lot was riding on the new film, and Valentino surely knew this. The Eagle is based loosely on a Pushkin story, Dubrovsky. Hans Crawley was tasked to fashion the tale into a scenario suitable for Valentino. Hans Crawley is likely best remembered for his witty films with Ernst Lubitsch. His scenario blended the Pushkin story with touches hinting at the mark of Zorro and came up with a winning formula. There is just enough action, just enough romance, and a nice dose of tongue-in-cheek humor that makes this film breeze along. The sets were designed by William Cameron Menzies. Menzies hinted at Russia with the California Romantica twist. Historical accuracy to the period was never uppermost in Hollywood productions. This film was no different. The settings set the mood and give you a hint of the period in an attractive manner. Valentino and Banky were opulently costumed by a then relatively unknown Gilbert Adrian. Adrian, of course, is best remembered for his stunning costume work at MGM in the 1930s and early 1940s. In The Eagle, he literally drapes Banky in long strands of flapper's pearls while Valentino is costumed in a stylized Cossack uniform. Valentino is given ample opportunity to show not only his romantic skills, but also his wry comedic side in this film. Fans were less familiar with the lighter side of Valentino. This film really contains one of his most engaging performances. Light on his feet and quick-witted, this hero finds it more and more difficult to maintain or follow through on his vow of vengeance as his ardor for the daughter of his enemy grows. Valentino took pride in doing his own stunts in the film. He suffered a slight injury during production, but and it was reported in various newspapers. The injury, however, was the result of a car accident and not due to any of the accident on, on film. Vilma Banky, on loan from Samuel Goldwyn, shines and shows a real rapport with Valentino on screen. The barrier of language did not hamper their on-screen chemistry, and Banky proved herself to be not only a beauty, but a charming and witty foil for Valentino in this film. So well did they mesh, she would be cast in what would end up being Valentino's final film, The Son of the Sheik. Director Clarence Brown was responsible for the casting of Louise Dresser as Catherine the Great. Dresser was fresh off the success of her tour de force in The Goose Woman. Brown related to Kevin Brownlow later on that Louise Dresser was great as The Goose Woman. I paid her $350 a week for that. I used her again as Cat Queen Catherine and in, in The Eagle, and that was for $3,000 a week. Truly, this was luxury casting. The role of Catherine was not exactly large, but Dresser makes the most of her delightful seduction scene with Valentino. She clearly enjoyed her turn as the royal vamp. Sharp-eyed viewers will see Keystone alumnus Max Wayne in a small part, and Gustav von Seifertitz can be seen briefly as well. Clarence Brown and Valentino got along famously given their love of all things mechanical. Valentino also shared a special rapport with Brown's young daughter, Adrian. Brown's light directorial touch is evident throughout the film. There is also a big bravura uh, that has to be noted in Brown's now famous tracking shot along the grand dining table. It was so good an effect that Brown used it again in the 1935 film starring Greta Garbo, Anna Karenina. The cinematography was manned uh, by veteran George Barnes and assisted by Deb Jennings. There is great depth of focus in many shots, and the shadows are used effectively and romantically, a precursor to Barnes's Academy Award-winning work on Rebecca. Valentino's personal life was not very happy during the filming of The Eagle. His marriage to Natasha Rombova was crumbling, and they soon separated. It seems clear that he took some refuge from his personal troubles during the shoot. He enjoyed the company of many visitors, old friends and new. Among them were Marion Davies and Eric von Stroheim. Spanish court painter Federico Beltran Massas also dropped by during filming. Additionally, Valentino also had to take time off to appear in traffic court to pay fines for a violation and the news photographers were there as well. Production was completed in the late summer and United Artists worked quickly to get the film ready for release on November 8, 1925. Valentino traveled to New York for the premiere and then made his way to London for the premiere at the Marble Arch Pavilion. He was joined there by his brother and his family in London. Both brothers look very natty in their tuxes. 
The reviews of the film were mixed. Some critics enjoyed it, others held it as lacking. Whatever the critics said, however, the fans lined up and enjoyed this delightful film. I hope that you will also, and I wish I could be there in person to enjoy it with you. A big thank you to Southwest Silence for inviting me to provide some comments, and I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>